Thank you, John. And welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us at our worship service today. As you can see, I am preaching to you from our worship hall here at our Vega Center. Actually, I'm really looking forward to this day that we could come together and physically worship God together in this place. But as you all know, that our government has shifted again our quarantine level from MGCQ to GCQ. So from 50% uh, permitted to come together, 50% of our venue facility, we are now down to 10 people maximum for our mass gathering. But that's okay, that's all right, because that will give us even more time to prepare and make sure that we are going to be safe when the time comes that we can come together in one place to worship God. In fact, we believe that that is actually the design of the Lord for the church, to come together physically. And so we just have to do it with wisdom and, of course, with faith. And because that is what we want to do, first with wisdom, so therefore, we're going to do this exactly the, the way that IATF and our LGU has prescribed us to do. But also we want to do this with faith. And one of the reasons that is why we are here today preaching to you from our worship hall because we want to create this longing inside every one of us for that day that we could come together because that is exactly the mission of God for us. Physical gathering is not just a preferred method. But here in Victory, we believe that physical gathering is actually part of the mission that God has for all of us. So until that day comes, we're going to practice faith, but also we're going to practice wisdom at our mass gatherings. Amen. So now, for the Word of God, we're going to continue with our preaching series entitled The Gospel Explored. And this week, we're going to talk of God as one of our attempts to look at another facet of the grace of God, if you have experienced the grace of God, when you say God, do you really know how you experience Because what I believe for being able to appreciate what truly the Lord has done for us, we have to be acquainted. We have to understand what the grace of God is. I remember when I was in college, you know those times, it was, life was just really hard. Uh, I was studying hard. But also, finances was hard. And I remember one time, I was, uh, I was worried about my finances. I wouldn't, able, I wouldn't be able to last for the entire week because uh, of some non you know, unwise decisions with my allowance. And so I found myself worshiping at one of our worship services and I was giving my, my all to the Lord in worship but I was also worried about my finances because I just ran out of money and then during that time the worship services was really intense there were no chairs during the worship time and people were just dancing and raising their hands and jumping around and kicking the air and at that particular worship service I found my bag got accidentally kicked around by the people worshiping the Lord. So it took a while for me to get my bag, but when I did, I was so shocked to see that my bag was actually a bit heavier. When I opened it, I found out that somebody had secretly placed so many groceries inside. And I realized that's an example of the grace of God, a good thing that you receive but you know you didn't deserve. I definitely did not deserve that kind of blessing. But nonetheless, I received it. And therefore, I believe that's an example of the grace of God. But is that what the grace of God is all about? Or is there so much more? This week, we're going to look at the grace of God as another facet of the gospel. And hopefully, we won't just understand, but we will appreciate to the point that it will rattle us. It will bring about change in the way we look at the gospel. And an appreciation would start to change our lives. That is my prayer 
for today. So, we are going to look at Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 21. But for the sake of time, I'm going to read only verses 18 to 21. So, I'm going to read from the ESV. Romans 5, verse 18. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now, the law came in, in to increase the trespass, but for sin increase grace abounded all the more so that as sin reigned in death grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through jesus christ our lord you see romans chapter 5 verse 12 to 21 talks about the grace of god now to appreciate this facet of the gospel i believe that you know this passage of scripture has three it has three parts that if we look at it will help us appreciate what this grace of god is talking about i when i looked at the parts of this passage of scripture i see these three parts as the first one the conclusion and uh, you can see it with the word therefore the conclusion the twist and then the third part will be the bonus we're going to look at all of those three today let's start with the first part which is the conclusion this is amazing why would you start with the conclusion but you know that's just how it is we start with the word therefore in verse 12. you know when you see this word you know it's a conclusion it says therefore but the question is, conclusion to what? Conclusion to what was previously said. When you say previously said, I believe it's talking about Romans chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5. But we don't have time to talk about all of those five chapters. But I do think that it was summarized best in the statement in chapter 3, verse 23 to 24. And I, I'd like to paraphrase it. And it says... All have sinned, but all have been given grace. So, there's sin, but there's also grace. Now, the Bible is saying that sin is upon us, but at the same time, grace is also upon us. Somebody said once to me that if you want to appreciate the gospel, you have to know the bad news first, so that you would know, and uh, you would appreciate the good news. So, the bad news is sin, and the good news is grace. Let's talk about this grace. I don't think we'd ever be able to understand what it means and implies to us today if we don't dig in to what the opposite of this grace is, which is sin. So, Let's start with that. The first thing that this verse is telling us is that sin is powerful. I know, I know, it's just like a downer, right? Let's talk about the bad news first. Sin is powerful. Sin is potent. When you say potent, it's like talking about a drug. It's a, it's a ability to affect uh, something or someone. And the Bible is saying that sin is actually potent. Sin is powerful. In verse 12, it says, there, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. And so if you can summarize that, it says there from uh, one man, one sin, I wonder who that one man is, all were brought to death. Not just one, but all, you know, look. <laughs> One more. Yeah. And the first time I read this, I said, who is this one man? 
uh, that the Bible is talking about. You see, we would probably never be able to understand the, or appreciate the meaning if we don't understand the context. And the Bible kept, kept on saying one man, and because of this one man, everybody sinned. So who is this one man? And I answered, this one man is Adam. Adam is the first man, and he was the one who sinned, and because of him, everyone sinned. Why is that? Why would we say that? Why would the Bible say that? Okay, let me explain that. When God said, let us make man in our image, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, he actually meant all mankind. Not just man, Adam, but also man and woman, uh, the human race. So when he created Adam, did you know that he didn't just create Adam as the first human being, but he created Adam as one from which all other human beings will be created from. Remember that Eve was created from Adam, right? So every human being will be created from him. So every human being that will be created after Adam will be able to get their materials, their physical nature, their spiritual nature from him. That's why many Bible scholars call Adam as the progenitor of mankind. Uh, the, Bible, the Bible scholars also say, said that, that Adam when he comes in union with his wife, will be the federal head or the ultimate and the legal representative of all mankind. Some people put it this way, that the human race was already in Adam's loins when he was brought into being, meaning that Adam was carrying mankind within him when he was alive. And because he carries the entire human race with him, he was the legitimate and ultimate representative. And so every, every man, that will, every human being that will be born after them will be able to get, obtain, inherit his nature, his physical nature, and even his spiritual nature. And so when Adam sinned, the representative sinned, the represented mankind sinned as well that my friends is what we call the potency of sin sin is that powerful now when we go to the second part i said the first part is a conclusion the second part is a twist because it starts with the word but you know um but is a when you see the word but it it means that whatever has been said so far is incomplete what will be said next defines and completes the thought. But. Sin is potent, but. So, that's, it means sin is potent, but that's not all. And let's read on. In verse 15, it says there, But the free gift is not like the trespass. Trespass is another word for sin. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. So let us, let us complete the thought that I said in the, first, in, in the first point. The first point was, sin is potent, but that's not all. So let's complete it this time. Let's put in the twist. Sin is potent, but God's grace is much more potent. God's grace is much more potent. You see, what it means is, from one man caused sin and death to come to all, but also, from one man also, this time it's no longer Adam, but it's Jesus Christ, God's grace gave all men a way back to be brought to life, which is, technically speaking, is a, you could say it's a harder thing to do. Relatively speaking, I would say that with bringing death to something or someone is easier. Even human beings are capable of doing that. But when you talk about bringing the dead to life, man, that's impossible for human beings. That's, that's even harder. 
I guess it's just, we can say that it's only possible with the author of life himself. That's a harder thing to do, and therefore it takes more power to be able to do that. And that's why we say that sin is potent, sin is uh, powerful, but the grace of God is much more powerful to be able to bring the dead back to life. And it's amazing because if you look at the verse, it says there that, that the grace of God is not just more powerful, the grace of God is much more. Did you see that detail? It says that it's much more powerful. That's, there's the emphasis there. And the reason is because sin came through Adam, but God's grace came through Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is greater than Adam. God's grace is much, much more powerful than sin. We don't want to be blind from the fact that sin is powerful, but we also want to say that God's grace is much, much more powerful. This is good news. This is so important that the author, uh, the author, the Apostle Paul felt it was important to repeat that twice in this passage of scripture the first one was in verse 17 and the second one is in verse 20 let's read verse 17 it says there for if because of one man's trespass death reigned from that one man much more did you see the phrase there much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in all life through the one man jesus christ amazing he had to repeat it because it's that important. And he didn't just do it once, he did it twice. The second one is in verse 20. Now, the, verse, let's, let's read it. Now, the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So, did you see the phrase in there? It's not much more, but it says all the more. Showing us that yes, sin may, might be powerful, but the grace of God is even more powerful. Let me tell you, if you are struggling with sin today, if you are feeling the power of sin at work in your life, and you're probably saying, I'm a Christian already, why is this happening to me? Why am I having these battles and struggles with sin, and yet I feel like I'm, I'm powerless? You know, that may be your fact right now. But I want you to know that the truth is stronger and bigger and more real than the facts. And I hope and I pray that the truth will change your facts. Because the truth is, the, the sin may be powerful, but the grace of God is much, much more powerful. It can be more powerful in your life today if you will allow it. And I claim in Jesus' name that the grace of God will begin to manifest its power over sin in your life today. Praise God. That's such good news. That is what we call the gospel. But the amazing thing here is, it is not even finished. I said there are three parts. The first one is the conclusion. The second one is the twist. And the third one is basically the bonus. Uh, you can see it in verse 16. In verse 16, it, it starts with the word end. And when you hear, when you see this word end, it's an addition. It, you think it's already complete, you had it good already, but here's this verse that says, that starts with end, meaning there's more. Kind of like, do you know, you know, people are so into Lazada and Shopee these days, online shopping, and you know, there are so many, so many uh, advertisements that says, but wait, there's more. It's kind of like that, a moment like that. Not only that the effect of God's grace is much more than the effect of sin, it's saying that there's so much more. What, what could be more than that? Well, here's what's more. The work of God's grace revokes and reverses the work of sin in our lives. That is what's more. You see, not only that the grace of God is much more powerful, but if we look into the mechanics of what the grace of God does, it's just amazing. You would see that it, not only that it cancels and it revokes what sin has done, but it also reverses the effect of sin. When you hear the word revoke, 
and reversed, what comes to your mind? For me, it's credit cards. Have you ever had your credit card revoked or declined? Maybe you have that moment in, at the restaurant and you're about to pay and you are told, sorry, sir, your card has been declined. What a disappointment, right? It has lost its power. It has been canceled. You see, the word revoke means to officially cancel, like you know, a credit card being cut by a scissor. And the word reverse, it means to do a new work that is the exact opposite of the previous one. Can you imagine the grace of God doing that to the work of sin in our lives? That's amazing. That's good news right there. In verse 16, let me read it. Let me read the bonus. It says there, end. the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought what? What's the work of sin? Brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. You see, sin may bring condemnation. It's, it's work. But God's grace cancels that and instead brings justification. Amazing. It didn't just took away what the work of sin is. It, just, it replaces it with something that is so much better. The exact opposite, actually. This is such good news that Paul also thought that it would be worth it to repeat that thought. So in verse 18, it was repeated. Not just in verse 18, but, it, but also in verse 19. In verse 18, it says there, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men. So one act of righteousness leads to justification in the life of all men. It's the same thing. Condemnation turned into justification. It was revoked, it was canceled, and then it was reversed. So from condemnation, it was replaced by justification. Imagine being condemned one time and then another time. It's just as if you've never sinned. That's amazing. That's the gospel for all of us. And then it was repeated in verse 19. It says there, for, by, for us by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's disobedience, the many will be made righteous. So if you think about it, sin made sinners out of many, but God's grace cancels and then makes the many Righteous. It cancels the work of sin and reverses it. So, the grace of God, what an amazing thing, brought to us by Jesus Christ. In conclusion, here's what I want to say. Verse 21 says it all. I'd like to close with this. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I want to say that God's grace doesn't just revokes and reverses sin's work. You know, when I said in the conclusion that if there's a comparison between the power of sin and the power of grace, the power of grace will win. It's no match, right? Sin is no match with, against grace. But also, there's more. When we look at how it works, it says it revokes and it cancels the work of sin. But here's, if I may add one more as I conclude. Is that okay? Here's one more. The way that the grace of God revokes and cancels the work of sin, it does it in a fashion that is, here are some words to describe it. Lavish, bountiful, and super abundant. And let me show you in this verse, in verse 21, it says there, not just from death to life, we are brought to, from death into eternal life. And, and so, it would have been nice if we were brought from death to life. But no, that's not good enough for God. When God... When God gave, when God redeemed, when God revoked the power of sin, He said, I'm going to go all out. I'm going to go big. And He said, I'm not just going to bring you from death to life. I'm going to bring you from death to eternal life. There's going to be life forever. 
So no, not, not only that he, that the work of sin was undone, it was undone decisively. This is my prayer for all of us today. And maybe you're a Christian already and you're saying, I know what you're saying, Pastor. I'm familiar with that, but I don't feel that in my life because even though I'm already a Christian, I feel like the work of sin is still present. It's still waging war against me. And there are times, honestly speaking, that I, I lose the battle. But I want you to know that even though that is your fact, and I hope and I pray that the truth of the word today will become your reality. You see, I remember Job. Remember Job? Job in the Bible when he lost everything he had? You know what happened in the end? In, in chapter 42, verse 10, it says there, And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. You know, I realized when God restores, He goes big. He goes all out. He doesn't just replace. He replaces lavishly. I also remember Romans 8, verse 28, and I pray this verse to all of us today. It says there, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who had been called according to His purpose. I want you to know today that God's love is not just for a certain few. God's love is for you, for me, and for everyone in this world. God's love is all-encompassing. And God's love is upon you today. And God's love never fails. And the Bible says, for those of us that He created, He also loved. He gave a destiny. He gave a purpose. He gave a calling. And He will work for the good for, of, of us, of our situation. So, I want to pray for those of you who we're probably hearing this message and are feeling a different reality happening in your life today, especially during this quarantine. Maybe you're not feeling victorious today. Maybe you're not feeling, you know, the truth of this sermon today. But I hope and I pray that Romans 8.28 will happen to you. That you would understand that God will work for the good of those whom He called. And I hope that you understand that He is calling you today. He has a calling for all of us to be in this perfect relationship with Him. So, if you don't have that kind of relationship, I want to pray for you right here from Vega Center to your homes. I want to pray for you right now. Lord, I pray for every person who's uh, hearing this broadcast, especially those who are seeing a different reality in their life as they battle against sin as they battle against life and their struggles and their challenges in life are actually winning most of the time and i pray that as they hear this message as they hear your word today it will give them hope and i pray and i hope that the reality of your truth will become their reality right now lord i lift up to you what they're going through today and Lord, I pray if they feel so far from you, if they don't feel this grace that you're talking about, I pray that they would feel it this week. I pray that uh, there will be nothing that will keep them from feeling, from understanding, from discovering what you're talking about when you said the grace of God is more powerful than the power of sin. So Lord, I pray that this week will be a discovery of the power of that grace in our life. And for those of you who are already Christians, I would like to pray another prayer for you, especially for you. If you and I know this can be tricky because as Christians, there, there's a certain pressure to be okay. There's a certain pressure to project that everything is fine. But if we're going to be honest with God, the struggle is real. And there are moments when we feel like the power of sin is greater than the power of the grace of God. But we know that the truth of the Word of God says it's the other way around. So I want to pray 
that the truth will prevail in your life that what the Bible actually says will be the one that will actually happen in your everyday. Lord, I pray for every person, every Christian who may be struggling, and I pray that even if we are struggling, it will not cause us shame because it's not true that we shouldn't struggle. Lord, I pray that every Christian who's hearing this would understand that because we're alive, we're still a work in progress. Because there are things that, that needs to grow in our life. There are allowances and there's the grace of God that allows us to accept that there are areas in our life that God is still working on. So Lord, I pray that whatever area that is, as we come to you today, and think about those areas. And if you're hearing me, I want you to think of those areas in your life that is still a struggle for you. And begin lifting them up to the Lord. And believe the Lord that when the Word says, the grace of God has a power more than your current struggle, you would hold on to that as a promise because that is the truth. So Lord, I pray for every Christian who can identify with what I just said. Help them, Lord, right now. Hold on to the promise of your word that says the power of your grace is much more powerful than the power of the struggle that we currently have. I pray for victory over those areas in their life. And I pray that the grace of God will begin to reverse, begin to revoke the discouragement, revoke the hopelessness, and begin to do a reversal work in their life today. And as you said in your word, to make us more than conquerors. This I claim for everyone who can relate to this prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. May the grace of God be upon you this week. Thank you, everybody. See you again.